Hello, welcome to the latest uh, live stream from Oxplore here at the University of Oxford, where we're going to be discussing big questions. And the question this week, as hopefully most of you are aware, is could we live on another planet? Which is a fantastic question. We have a fantastic panel of academics from the university who will be helping us discuss this, who I will introduce shortly. But before I get to that, I'm just going to let you all know basically how you can win some prizes because it's probably why we're all really here, isn't it? So um, there will be a prize draw and the way it works is there will be some details scrolling along the bottom of the screen, which will tell you how to get in touch with us. So you can use um, Instagram, you can use Twitter, you can email us. You can also use the chat window on the live stream page. And basically we want you guys watching to send us your questions. So what do you want to know based around the big question of could we live on another planet? And you can keep sending these in all throughout our live stream debate. You can also send them in right up until 11 a.m. tomorrow when we will announce the winner and send the lucky person uh, some buck vouchers. So without further ado, um, let's get cracking with the question. So as I said, could we live on another planet? Maybe you think that's an easy question. Maybe you don't. Who knows? But there's a lot to think about is the key thing to bear in mind. Hmm. So hopefully that gave you a few things to think about, sort of a few thoughts buzzing around in your head. So as I mentioned, we have our aforementioned panel here and they are now, of course, going to introduce themselves. So they are all academics here at the University of Oxford and we will we'll go in order, I think, and we'll start off with John. Hi, my name's John Wade. I'm a planetary scientist. I work in the Earth Science Department of the University of Oxford. And my research interest is really built around how planets form, how the Earth, Moon, Mars came to be, and the implications for that on how the planets then evolve. So questions I'm really interested in is what is the composition of the Earth's core, and also why is there still water on the surface of the Earth today? There isn't water on Mars, but there is on, on Earth. So how did this came to be? Hi, my name's Tessa Baker. I'm an astrophysicist in the physics department at Oxford. And I think a lot about the role of gravity in our universe. So gravity is really the dominant force that shapes the universe. Everything from the Big Bang to galaxies uh, to the lives of objects like stars and, and planets. Um, and the force of gravity that we experience on the surface of a planet would be a key factor we'd have to think about when assessing its viability for life. Uh, my name is Kasim Ali. I'm the Classics Outreach Officer. Uh, classics is the study of ancient Greece and Rome, their, the languages of the people that lived there, their civilizations, their culture, their philosophy, their history, uh, their literature. Um, and I think studying the ancient world is a really good way to kind of think about what do we think of as normal in our society today. It might be a really good jumping off point to think about how we might imagine what future societies might look like. So a good variety. You will hopefully agree. Uh, so we have a planetary scientist, we have a uh, astrophysicist, and we have a classicist. I'm particularly looking forward. Like, I'm really looking forward to Kasim's <laughs> thoughts on this, uh, and also you guys watching. Like how you know this link between civilizations and space and planets. I think it's really, really cool. Uh, so I'm I'm very much looking forward to see what what we discuss and what comes up. So now you know what they study, what they do, what they can. They are experts in. They are actual experts. Um, you know, again, send us your questions. Think about you know questions related to these particular topics. What do you want to know, and help us guide the debate so we can tell you guys what your you know the answers you want to hear, basically. Right. So to start off with, um, we've actually asked all of the panel to each bring in an object relevant to their academic area and relevant, of course, to the big question: Could we live on another planet? So John, I, I know your object is pretty heavy, yes. so I think we should start with yours so you don't have to hold it for too long. Uh, so please tell us about your object. So I've brought in an iron meteorite, and I dropped this on my toe this morning so I kind of know how the dinosaurs may have felt. Um, this weighs about 20 kilos, and it's a piece of almost pure iron. 
and it's, uh, it, it's the core of a small planet that didn't quite make it. This thing has been floating around space for the last 4.6 billion years, pretty much in this form. So these are some of the oldest things you can actually hold in your hands. And this is analogous to the Earth's core. So 3,000 kilometers beneath our feet is this big ball of molten iron, and it was made of very, very similar material to this. So this is, um, and this is very important, the, this, this metallic core in planets is essentially what keeps us alive. It provides a magnetic field which helps uh, life on Earth have evolved and not be damaged by radiation. So these sort of, this material is, uh, is very key to develop planetary development. I'm going to put it down now because it weighs a ton. <laughs> <laughs> it does, yeah. Tessa, what is, what is your, please tell us about your object and its relevance to our big question. So I brought in some sleeping pills. So even if we are able to overcome the challenges of getting off this planet and getting to another one, there's no guarantee that the planet we end up on will have um, all the comforts of home that we're used to. And one thing that might be very different is the experience of day and night and seasons on that new planet. So other planets outside our own solar system um, spin at very different rates depending on how they were formed. So uh, if a planet spins, um, if it takes more or less than 24 hours to spin on its axis, we've got to cope with a day and a night that's a different length. Similarly, if a planet is closer or further away from its parent star than our Earth is from the Sun, we'd have a year that has a different length. So a nice example of this is the planet Venus, which actually takes 243 Earth days to rotate once on its axis, but it only takes 225 days to go around the Sun. So on Venus, a year is actually shorter than a day. So every day really is your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Kasim, what do you have for us? Um, I brought in a, a replica, not an original, of uh, an ancient coin. This is a Deca Dracum from um, ancient Syracuse, which is in Sicily, kind of at the boot of Italy. Um, and it's from about 400 BC, which is um, 2,400 years ago. Um, and I've also got a kind of a, a 50p from modern England as a comparison. Um, I just want to think a little bit about kind of these objects as, as ways to think about how society functions now, how it used to function, how it might function in the future. Whoopsie. Um, both these coins look quite similar on one side. They've got kind of the head of of someone on the British coin, it's kind of Queen Elizabeth. Um, on this old Decadracum, it's a nymph from the local river um, in Syracuse. Um, and on the other side, we've got, uh, on the British coin, we've got this kind of seated female figure, which most people think is kind of a representation of Britannia as a goddess. Um, and on the Decadracum, we've got uh, kind of four horses and a chariot. Um, and some of the things we might think about are kind of, what would money look like uh, on another planet in a new civilization? Would we kind of continue with these systems of, of trade and value that we've kind of had for such a long time already? Um, or would we come up with something new? Um, and then kind of if we think about how rooted these coins and these images are to place um, kind of Britannia, this is a coin for England and it's kind of very invested in this idea of England as a place. And again, the same with the nymph on our Decadracum, it's related to the, to the river, to the place around. Um, what might we take with us um, <laughs> on another planet? It's okay, guys. At least it wasn't the meteorite. Yeah. Um, uh, for example, kind of the horses on, the, on these chariots, kind of we might think about leisure activities uh, on another planet. Kind of are we going to take um, things to do relating to kind of having fun? Um, are we going to take animals with us to other planets? Kind of humans have lived on this Earth for thousands of years in a kind of complex ecosystem with other animals and other creatures. Um, if we go and found a new civilization, is it just going to be us? A lot to think about, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So I, I particularly like that one about the animals, actually. I'm going I'm to throw this out there for everyone watching. OK, if you could take one animal with you from Earth <laughs> to, to our future civilization, um, which animal would you take with you? Um, I, I'm trying to think what I would. I'd maybe take a tiger. Um, so I could have it as like a little pet. <laughs> and <sort of> <laughs> and um. Maybe this is already sp spelling bad things for the <laughs> civilization. Anyway, <laughs> right, no, fantastic. Lots of very interesting things. So we've got iron cores and magnetic fields, of course, can play a role in our future planet. We've got the whole thing about day and night, and we've got lots of things to think about in terms of our civilization. So to some other questions then now. So I've got one here for you, John. Um, yes. What do you think... 
Yeah, <laughs> get ready. <laughs> what do you think would be the biggest challenge that we'd face if we were to move to a different planet? I think it would actually be getting there. The distances involved in getting from, say, the, the Earth to Mars or the Earth to Venus are huge. So Venus is uh, whew, about at its closest 26 million miles away. So one of the problems is this takes a long time. This transport from the Earth to this other planet would take a very long time. And you have to remember that the Sun is a big nuclear reactor throwing out lots of radiation. So one of the problems is you've got to spend a long time in space and you've got to be shielded from this radiation. Look, radiation isn't good for you. You know, when we get sunburns, it's, it's pretty painful. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously there's even more problems when you're spending a lot of time in space with high energy radiation. So getting there in a reasonable time, protecting yourself, and uh, transporting all that material that you actually need to build a new colony in space on a new planet is very, very difficult. So this is the big reason why we haven't, we've been to the moon and nowhere else. Um, it's the, 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 the distances in space are huge and the physical uh, problems are immense. Just with you mentioning there about getting things to and from the, I'm just imagining like, what if you were out of tea bags? I know. This, like, you know. You can't just pop to the shop. Well, you can't like, get Amazon to deliver them again, can exactly, you? Exactly, I mean, you no, know, <laughs> absolutely. And the internet <laughs> connection's gonna be pretty poor. I mean, uh, <laughs> Fabulous, right, Tessa, mm. one for you. Should we move to another planet? Should. So there are lots of reasons we might want to move. Um, some of those are self-inflicted, unfortunately. Um, things like global warming, nuclear weapons, overpopulation and competition for resources. So those things might drive us away sooner. But at the very latest, we do have a hard deadline for leaving our planet. Now, the good news is, don't need to panic, it's not for another 5 billion years. But in about 5 billion years, the sun will start to die. So sort of garden variety, average stars like our sun live for about 10 billion years. Ours is about halfway through its life. And what happens after 10 billion years is the sun will start to run out of hydrogen, which, is, which um, it burns as its main fuel. So it'll have to burn other elements within it instead. And when that happens, the chemical composition changes inside of the sun will cause it to swell up and become what we call a red giant star. And this red giant will be so big that most likely it will envelop the Earth. And at that stage, we are literally toast. <laughs> Other things we might have to think about even before then are um, asteroid impacts, like the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. We could expect something like that to, to hit us well before those five billion years are up. So, so in short, yes, we probably should. We well. should, not, <laughs> not tomorrow, don't panic, but one day, let's start thinking, yeah. Okay, yeah, always, always good to be prepared, I, I like it. Right, Kasim. so you, you made a lovely introduction earlier about you know, this idea of creating a new civilization and talked about various questions. And do keep sending in those animals, by the way. I'm, I'm actually looking forward to seeing <laughs> what you guys come up with. Probably better than my tiger. Um, so, if we were to create this new civilization, could, what lessons could we learn from the past? I think it's really interesting. So we've, whenever we study the ancient world, lots of times we kind of use models of ancient civilizations as kind of examples which we maybe should learn from. Um, but I think it's interesting to kind of think about how much and how little we should take from ancient civilizations. So often places like Athens in, in kind of the fifth century BC are held up as kind of civilizations which produced great art and literature and culture and kind of the foundations of modern democracy and things like that. Um, but it's really worth questioning kind of what worked for them and what didn't. Um, and one of the things we might say is places like Athens were a, a slave-owning patriarchal society. Um, we might also think of somewhere like Sparta, um, which was very invested in kind of creating the, the perfect society. Um, but they were, highly, they were highly eugenic about it. They kind of mm. controlled who had children. They controlled which children were allowed to grow up and where they grew up. Um, and very much kind of how people developed like that. So kind of there's lots of interesting things to think about when we're thinking about what we want our new civilization to look like from lessons from the past. Um, it's not something which uh, is a new thing to do, kind of imagining new civilizations. The ancient Greeks, we have loads of examples um, of the ancient Greeks imagining what a new civilization might look like. Um, you've got uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land, which is an invention of the comic player Aristophanes. Um, the idea of kind of 
what would happen if we had a, a new civilization kind of in between earth and heaven um, and how kind of the people that live there would kind of intercept the prayers as they went up, um, <laughs> be a wealthy society because of that. You have a kind of a very famous example of Plato's Republic, um, which is kind of a, this Greek philosopher who had the idea to kind of see what might a perfect society look like in terms of justice and laws and morality, kind of who should be in charge, how do we deal with kind of interrelationships. He concluded that kind of philosophers should be in charge, so I'm not <laughs> sure he was completely unbiased in, in the way he thought about it, but kind of how places relate to each other and how that works is a really interesting part, kind of thinking about how we might imagine um, mm. a new civilization. Absolutely. Clearly with pet tigers in yes, my case. Yes, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. Right, so. Um, we now have a, a little fun feature for everyone uh, watching and also, in fact, for our panel. We are going to put forward a multiple choice question uh, based around our big question, could we live on another planet? So the, the closest planet to Earth is Venus. And so the multiple choice question that we would like uh, you to answer and to select what you think is correct is, if you were going on a holiday to the planet Venus, how long would the flight take? So the, the answers hopefully are on the screen, but it's A, is it 11 days, B, 64 days, or C, 153 days. So please do have a bit of a think about this, have a bit of a discussion, and we ourselves are also, well, I'm going to ask the panel for their thoughts. So, John, what, what came to your mind when I, well, when I mentioned you're going on holiday to Venus, how long does the flight take? Well, what came to my mind was, what have I done wrong? <laughs> I mean, you know, Venus isn't exactly a holiday destination I want to go to. Um, the, the pressure on the surface of Venus is 92 times the atmospheric pressure on Earth. So it's very heavy. It's 92 bars. Uh, the temperature is 500 degrees C on the surface of Venus. So it's pretty warm as well. And on top of that, the weather, it doesn't rain water. It rains sulfuric acid. So, Tom, what have I done wrong? I mean, you know, why are you sending me to Venus? I, to me, this sounds like an adventure. Like, you know, get me one of these radiation suits so that I'll be nice and comfy. And off you go. And off I go, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm off you it, go, but. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, who knows? Uh, right, uh, Tessa. I'm not sure I want to go to Venus either. I'm, I'm a bit worried about this flight, to be honest. 11 days, I could just about cope with. But if it's 64 days or 153 days, that is a long time to spend cooped up in that tiny tin can with your family or whoever else <laughs> is going. Um, and you, know, you get really bored. Um, you'd also have to think about the effects it would have on your body. So uh, we know that muscle wasting is a real problem for astronauts who spend a long time in space because you don't have Earth's gravity to, to work against. So you, you start to lose some of your muscle. So I think we need to develop a, a fitness regime we're going to do on this, <laughs> on this rocket to Venus, I'm afraid. It'll, it'll pass some time, <laughs> and maybe not how you'd like to spend your time. The internet connection would be awful, wouldn't it? No Netflix. <laughs> no Netflix. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no Netflix and all workouts. I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to come on this holiday anymore. Yeah, this, is holiday. <laughs> this holiday's not looking good, is it? <laughs> and Cassie, anything to add? Well, I, just, I thought yeah, I'd be remiss not to mention that kind of Venus is the name of the Roman goddess. Um, the goddess of love and sex and kind of the Romans uh, peoples were kind of they were also looking to the stars and kind of wondering what and eventually they decided it was a who um, these kind of bodies moving through the sky were um, and I wonder maybe if we get to Venus we'll find out it's not actually a planet but the the home of the goddess Venus um, and what might happen there. <laughs> 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 Certainly something to ponder. Um, right, well, thank you very much. Um, so, of course, we would hopefully you've all now had a chance to think about this yourselves with some helpful and perhaps not so helpful input from our <laughs> panel. Um, and um, so we, we will now reveal the answer. Um, or actually, I know that John actually knows this one, being a, uh, the a planetary scientist that he is. So I'm going to pass over to John to explain the answer and, and why. Um, it's, uh, at its closest, Venus is about 26 million miles away from the Earth. At its furthest, it's around about 162 million. This is off the top of my head, so I'm not going to remember. Um, so the various, there were various missions that have flown to Venus, not many actually. There were the Venera missions in the 1970s and Mariner 2. So Venera was a Soviet Union mission and they actually landed on the surface of Venus. So we do actually have some pictures of the surface of Venus. And this is also how we know about the temperatures and the pressures of the atmosphere. Um, so Mariner 2 took about just short of four months, uh, Venera a similar sort of time. 
So in terms of this multiple choice, and I think this the, the, the number 153 days comes from, isn't that the European Mar uh, it Venus is, Express? It is the, the ESA's Venus Express so launched on November the 9th, 2005. So that got there very quickly. So 153 days is the answer. It is. That's a... It's a long time, yeah. Mm. And I, I really like that, that, that point you made about the distances. It's something I didn't think of straight away. The fact that, you know, if you're trying to fly to Venus when it's at its closest point to, yes. to Earth, yes. compared yes. to its furthest away point, that that's just, what is it, like seven times further or something? That's right. Like so this is why missions to different planets have very sort of fixed windows in which mm. they can take off from, because otherwise the planet moves further away from the Earth and you've got to use more energy catching up or, or getting to that planet. So yes, uh, th this because we're all orbiting the sun and we all orbit at different rates. Mm. I guess this would, of course, really have an effect. You know, if we found another planet elsewhere that we could inhabit, you would actually have, as you said, a window yes, of when yeah. you could get to and from with supplies and other people. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, or getting out, getting back as well. Mm. So you mm. couldn't just hop on your plane and or hop on your spacecraft and come back anytime you anytime you liked. You'd have to have to fix at certain points of the year. Oh, it's summertime. I've got to go and see my mum. <laughs> 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 Fabulous. Right, well thank you very much for explaining. Uh, well done to anyone who got that one correct. Um, so let's now move on to some questions sent in from our lovely audience. Um, so we have a fantastic question from St. James Senior Girls. Big shout out. Um, why is there water still on Earth and not on other planets? Oh, now I can answer this one. This is my specialist topic for 10. Actually, this is a really interesting question, I think. There's lots of reasons. Um, different planets have different gravity, so some water can be boiled off. Now, it's also maybe to do with the amount of water that each planet was given or accreted at its very start when it first formed. Different planets might have had different amounts of water. But questions we don't really know the answer to very well is where really did the water on Earth come from? Was it Sort of, is it all come out of the ground when the, when the Earth has cooled? Or was it added by cometary material after the Earth had formed? Um, and actually on Mars, we definitely know Mars had water, but it lost water about three, three and a half billion years ago. And there's lots of reasons why that might be so. Mars is a little bit smaller. It cooled very quickly. But it also could have reacted with its rocks. The rocks on Mars are much more iron rich. And when we look at Mars, we see it a very red planet, a very sort of rusty planet. So one of the things we think may have happened is that water actually on the surface of Mars, lots of oceans, just reacted with the rocks. And, it, and Mars dried up. Um, whereas on Earth, we've still got water. And again, how this happens, and this is very important for things like plate tectonics and life and everything else, but why this is so, again, is not a really clear answer. So us scientists don't know everything, and I think that's a fair thing to say. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, fantastic question, thank you. Um, now I've got one new for you here, Tessa. Mm. So before, you gave this fabulous description of the, of the expanding sun and the fact that it would make uh, the Earth toast, as, as you put it. So yeah. we have... Um, we have Aylesford School, hello to Aylesford School, who have asked, if the sun eats the earth, will the earth melt? Ooh, um, melt, well, given that it's a, a large uh, iron core, potentially some, you know, some layers of it would, would melt. Mm -hmm. Certainly everything on earth would be, uh, sorry, on the surface of the earth would be um, completely scorched, right? We would certainly lose all our oceans in this mm -hmm. event. We'd, we'd boil them off. Um, I don't think it's quite fair to say, you know, you just have like a molten gobby <laughs> bit of <laughs> earth sort of hanging there in, in your red giant, but it would basically get dissociated and absorbed into the material of this, this red giant, which is so much bigger than earth. We'd, we'd basically get lost in this red giant. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound pleasant either way, does it? No. <laughs> um, okay, fab. And now I think this one I'm going to put to you, Cassie. Now this is a tricky one. This has come from Felstead, so thank you. And this is, who should be in charge of the new planet? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> me and my, oh, not, no. not John, not, John. <laughs> not me and my tiger. No. What do you think? I, mean, I don't think it should be me either, but uh, I think it's a really, really important and interesting question, especially when we think about kind of, um, how kind of colonies as a, as a kind of a, a model of how that might have worked in the past and how it might work in the future. Um, kind of who is in charge of the small groups of people that go off and um, represent them somewhere else? Kind of who are we going to send? Are we going to send kind of representatives from every country on Earth? Um, or are we going to have kind of, is it going to be a NASA project and kind of run by America? Is it going to be a Russian space program project and run by them? Um, is it going to be a huge collaborative thing um, using as many people as possible? Um, when we get there then, who's, on, who's in charge and kind of what happens when those people interact? 
um, is really interesting. There's an ancient Greek historian called Thucydides who tells us a story about um, two very small, insignificant colonies of uh, Corinth and Athens who got into a little squabble and caused a war between these two big cities that lasted kind of more than 50 years. Um, so kind of who's, on who's in charge on, the, on, on this hypothetical new civilization and kind of how those people interact with each other is going to be a massive part of kind of earth politics as well um, and how we relate to those colonies mm. wherever they might be. Mm. That links really nicely into this next question. So I'm going to open this to the entire panel. Okay. So from Dame Allen School, uh, again, thank you very much for these questions. They are brilliant. We have the question, we've ruined this planet, <laughs> so should we not live with the consequences? <sighs> Who would like to jump in on that one? Any thoughts from anybody? It's a philosopher question first, isn't it? Yeah, yeah well, I, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a, it brings to mind immediately to me the idea that for lots of previous civilizations, Earth and humanity are kind of inextricably linked. So for the ancient Athenians, they had this idea of autochthony, um, which is the idea that they were born from the Earth in Athens, so that humans in Athens rose out of the ground. They are part of the soil. Um, and it's one of the reasons why they kind of didn't let anyone else into Athens. To be a citizen of Athens, your father had to have been a citizen of Athens. It kind of, you could only inherit citizenship. Um, and I think that's an idea which we kind of still have a really interesting relationship to, the idea that we're kind of humans and Earth are kind of part of the same thing. If we go back to our kind of our modern 50p coin, we've got Britannia, this kind of representation of Britain on a coin, this idea that kind of our civilization, our society is still very much tied to uh, the place which we're in is a really important one. I don't know if that means that we should live with the consequences um, <laughs> of destroying the Earth. I think that kind of humanity is infinitely adaptable and kind of the long history of humanity shows us that kind of what being human means has changed multiple times and kind of how we live together has changed. So I see no reason for us to not kind of keep changing that definition and maybe being human might become detached from being on Earth at some point. Maybe we should not be quite so negative and think that, you mm. know, life on Earth um, has, well, our life on Earth might be, might be pretty, we might have made that problematic. But actually, um, we don't really see, we, there's no evidence for, we've not found life on other planets yet. Mm. And the reality is, you know, we are quite a special planet. We've got liquid water, we're 4.6 billion years old, we've had all this evolution going on, and we've got atmosphere and plants and whatever. So one way to look at that might actually be, um, if we do live with the consequences, maybe we should, should treat the planet with a little bit more care and consideration mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and think about it that way rather than thinking that, you know, we can't go anywhere else because we've made a mess of this one. <laughs> um, actually getting to another planet is difficult, as you say, so we should maybe, maybe take a bit more care. <laughs> I yeah. was going to say, we might not have a, a choice here. Exactly. I mean, mm. given the number of exoplanets, so that's planets outside our own solar system, that we now know about. We have uh, something like 4,000 known exoplanets um, now discovered, um, not all of which are suitable for life, you know, some are too big, too hot or whatever. But if we do find one that has all the conditions we want, i.e. a prime bit of real estate, we might find it already taken. We might not be able to, to go there because, you know, there may be other civilizations and given the number of planets we're discovering, even just in our local patch of the galaxy, and given that there are tens of billions of galaxies out there, I think there has to be life out there on other planets. So I think we've got competition. <laughs> I'm with you on that, actually. Mm. I, I could approach this from a mathematical perspective. Um, and so we have this famous equation uh, called Drake's equation. Mm. Some of you may have heard of this. Yeah. Um, and basically it's, it's an equation with various terms in it and if you plug in the numbers of sort of the probability of life, it basically comes out and says that somewhere in the universe there will be life. But, you know, it's quite a small probability but it's non-zero, which means that, you know, if you search for long enough and far enough because the universe is so big, there should be life in there. Mm. So this is quite contentious but I, I'm very much with you. I think that there just has to be yeah. no, some form the, of... I take the other angle. Oh. You see, I'm a bit more bit more pessimistic about life. <laughs> There's lots of things that have to happen when you build the planet. Even things like the moon forming event, which we know happened very late on, has a big consequence for the development of the planet thereafter. So these are all very random events that have to happen in the right order. So I'm not quite so hopeful that there's the, the, the same number of planets that are habitable um, for us. And they're also a very long way away. So even if they were habitable, we've got to get there. Yeah, yeah That's that the big true. problem. Mm. I don't think, I don't think I don't think anyone is within reach at the moment, no. but the size of the universe is such that I, 
I can't see it not happening more than once. Mm. Okay. Right, Kasim, back to you. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> you're, to, you're getting, you know, people are, as I said, this whole idea of civilizations, I think it's, it's fantastic to bring to this, to this question. It's not something you'd immediately think about. So we have a great question from Chris. Thank you, Chris. Which is, if we moved to another planet, would there be a universal economy? And should there be a universe, Ooh. like, be a universal <sighs> economy? Uh, so, I'm not 100% sure what a universal economy might be. Um, some of the ideas might be kind of, would it be one that's universal to both our current Earth economy and this mm. new place? Are, is, are the resources kind of, I'm not an economist, but kind of the way we put value on things is kind of based on a finite system of resources. Um, if we then add another whole planet's resources and ways of doing things to that system, how will that economy kind of play out with each other? Um, how will value change? How will, will inflation travel across the <laughs> galaxy to our new planet? Um, how will things be costed? Um, I mean, I think ideally I'd love for the, our new planet, if, we're, if, we're, if we've got the chance to start again, it'd be really great to kind of scrap money as a thing. Um, I'm not sure it's, it's great for humans. Um, it'd be really great if we had kind of a system of kind of uh, especially because we're going to have to monitor how very closely kind of the resources mm. we take to this new planet. Things like oxygen, for example, which we might be taking for granted, but it might be something we have to kind of terraform on our new planet. So kind of access to, to oxygen and water and food and, and everything shouldn't, I don't think, should be kind of part of an economic transaction, um, especially if we kind of think of starting a new planet as kind of a, a global project to save humanity from our inevitable burning up in this red um, giant, um, <laughs> we kind of want to make it work as best we can. So, kind of some kind of system which kind of tries to give everyone everything equally um, is just in a way that kind of Plato would have wanted us to think about a new society as, um, and kind of shares things out equally. Kind of, I feel like I'm going down a communism route here, <laughs> um, and maybe that's the antithesis of kind of a universal economy would be kind of scrapping economy altogether. Potato-based economy. A potato-based economy. <laughs> That's what we need. Yes. That brings me very nicely <laughs> onto my next question, then, John. <laughs> now uh -oh. that you brought up potatoes, uh -oh. <laughs> um, so I, we were having a bit of a discussion earlier, me and John, and I basically said if he could take one item to another planet, what would it be? And of course, it'd be great as well if you, if you guys watching had to think about this. You can only take one item with you to your new planet, plus all the various allocated resources. But one specific thing to you, what would you take? And I know John wants to take potatoes. Potatoes. So you're going to have to explain this one. Well, potatoes. I mean, you know, <laughs> chips, crisps, mashed potatoes, roast <coughs> potatoes. Um, I'm not a chocolate fan, but I think the potato, I really miss a potato. I really miss <laughs> chips and crisps. So no, I'm taking potatoes. You can leave your tiger at home. <laughs> I'm taking my spuds. I think I'd have chocolate over potatoes any day. I can grow potatoes. <laughs> I can just grow more That's of them. True, yeah. I can have a potato-based economy. So Very I true. thought one um, quite interesting thing to take would be musical instruments, um, particularly things like stringed instruments. If you take those to a planet that has a different um, pressure and an atmosphere composed of you know, different ratios of, of, of gases, you could um, get very different sounds out of your, your standard guitar. So I think I'm going to set up a little orchestra, a little string quartet on our, our new planet, and it's going to you know, break onto the scene with some new style of music. <laughs> Much more highbrow than my chips. <laughs> I feel like my highbrow answer should be kind of a laptop with kind of unlimited storage so that I can <laughs> read lots and lots of new things. But I think my, my real answer is probably I want to take the PlayStation because I haven't finished God of War yet. Um. Fair enough. <laughs> um, okay, and just one final thing. Um, we've had quite a few people asking um, what kind of conditions or resources would we actually need to find on this, you know, this mythical planet that we are going to move to. So I guess this is probably more for John and Tessa. What kind of things would we need on this planet? First of all, you need a planet with a solid surface. So um, of the planets in our solar system, some like Mars and Earth have solid rocky surfaces or, or oceans in our case, but others of them like Jupiter and Saturn are gas giants, right? They're literally huge balls of gas. And they are dense in the, in the centre, but the surface is, is, you know, miles and miles of gas. So to start with, we need something we can actually stand on. Um, I think we were agreeing earlier that pressure is an important thing. Mm -hmm. If the pressure is too high because of, you know, the different atmosphere, we're going to get crushed to death. We'll need exoskeletons to walk around outside. Um, on the other hand, if the pressure is too low, you can't actually keep liquid water 
uh, on the surface, which, which in itself is a huge problem. Um, so those are two things that spring to my mind. So water is one of them. I mean, so we, we need liquid water. We rely on liquid water for all sorts of things. So that fixes the temperature range between 0 and 100 degrees. So really we want to be in a sort of temperate range, you know, sort of sub 50 degrees uh, centigrade. I mean, the other thing is oxygen. Um, we obviously need oxygen and we've evolved to take into account uh, there's about 20% oxygen in, in the atmosphere. So we've evolved to take that into account and oxygen is in the atmosphere because of life. So ideally, all these little things, if we, unless we took our oxygen or we made oxygen on the surface, we'd really, like, uh, we'd really want to look for a planet that looks almost like Earth. And that would be the ideal thing, is it looks like Earth. Maybe without a few poisonous spiders and snakes, but you know. <laughs> yeah. And we are searching for those planets right now, actually. It's, mm. it's worth mentioning um, there, are, there are missions. Actually, there's um, a mission called TESS, which was launched just last month. It was launched in April 2018. Um, which is a planet finding mission. Um, so we look for, we have various methods of looking for planets orbiting uh, around other stars. And as I mentioned earlier, not all of them are Earth-like, but some of them, the ones we're particularly interested in, are the ones that live in the, um, the right sort of distance away from their planet that can have liquid water. And more and more uh, missions are coming, um, JWST, Plato, so we should be finding more and more Earth-like planets in the future. Mm. Fab. <laughs> so hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed, because it sounds like we're going to need one. Right. So um, that just about wraps it up in terms of the, everyone's questions. So again, thank you everyone so much for sending in your questions. And I'm really sorry that I couldn't get to them all. There were like literally hundreds on my screen. <laughs> um, so again, thank you. And we're going to pick uh, three schools to actually receive a buck as a thank you. Uh, three bucks that are actually on the table. Uh, live, live prop from the actual event. We might even sign them. I'll get the panel to sign them for <laughs> you as well. Um, so again, thank you very much. And of course, the prize draw. Don't forget about the prize draw. You can keep sending in your questions right through until tomorrow morning, and we will pick our favourite and then send you some vouchers. Right. So as I said, time to vote. So you have. Um, I think there are several options here. But remember, the big question that we are answering after hearing all of the thoughts of our panel and myself, and hopefully you guys um, watching at home at school. Um, big question is, could we live on another planet? So please do vote, have a discussion about it. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to give us their final thoughts, uh, short and sweet if you can. Could we live on another planet? Yes, if we could find one. <laughs> That's very short and sweet. Yes, if we could find one. Tessa? We need to get off Earth, that is for certain. Could we live in a space colony? Maybe that's an alternative to living on another planet if we can't find one. Like a, like a space yeah, station? Yeah, a giant space it. station. Mm. Wow. Um, I think it's really important to think about who the we is in the could we live on another planet. Um, and any kind of project like this <laughs> needs to think about kind of um, who's in charge, as someone asked quite rightly. Yeah. You know, where's the money coming from? What's our aims? Are we going to just take the inequality of Earth and repli replicate it somewhere else? Or can we kind of make something better? Um, kind of utopia is the word we, we kind of threw around a bit, but um, it's got two Greek etymologies. One means like the best place and another means no place. Um, so could, yeah. a, could a perfect society exist? I'm not sure, but I think the we really needs to be interrogated. Very good point. And I'm, I'm going to, I guess I should probably answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to say yes and, and okay. agree with, with John. I think, you know, if we found something, I think we could make it work. As Cassie mentioned, humans are very adaptable. And, you know, we sort of redefine what, what hu being human is, what civilization is, etc. So I think we could, but we would have to find one first. Mm. That's the... And that's get there. And get, get there. there. Yes, and get there. Right. So um, that pretty much wraps it up. So thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much to our, our lovely panel. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank please you. do uh, keep voting. It's open until 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Do keep sending your questions as well. And uh, tune in for the next one. Uh, the next live stream that we'll be doing and check out Oxplore for more great discussions around this topic, around various other big questions. It's a really great website. I can say this because I actually work for them. It's actually really <laughs> good and you should all check it out. It's amazing. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.